They say the desert can never keep a secret. That if you can wait long enough, the sands will give back what they have concealed. This is the story of one such secret and an attempt to uncover it. Mauritania is the least populated country in Africa and amongst the poorest in the world. But the sands near the tiny oasis of Chingeti may just contain a treasure of priceless value to the world. It's enthralled generations of adventurers and cursed the first man to tell its tale. Known as the City of the Dunes, this is the seventh holiest city of Islam, a place of pilgrimage and a renowned seat of learning. Modern Chingeti was established a thousand years ago when the first town was swallowed by the sands. Today they're still on borrowed time while the great dunes mass at the edge of town. Chingeti has changed little since it was home to Captain Gaston Ripair, a distinguished soldier wounded in action and posted to Mauritania as a diplomat in 1916. The facts of his story have been the subject of much debate, but it began simply enough. Shortly after his arrival in Chingeti, Repair left his office one evening bound for the edge of town and a rendezvous with a local chieftain. The man had reluctantly agreed to take him to a secret source of natural iron said to be somewhere out in the dunes. Repair claims that they rode for 12 hours in a southeasterly direction. It was so dark, he said he was led as if blind. At dawn, they reached an area of great dunes too difficult for the camels and proceeded on foot. In his diaries, Repair alleges that his guide became very agitated and had forbidden him to take notes or compass bearings. The reason became clear, says Repair, when they were confronted by a huge hill of iron. It was 40 meters high by 100 long, topped by strange spikes and shining like a mirror in the sun. Was he confused? Was it a hoax, or had he seen the largest meteorite on Earth? The story would have meant nothing if he hadn't brought a piece back with him. The fragment went first to a French geologist in Dakar, and some years later reached Paris, where Alfred Lacroix, the leading expert in the field, declared the fragment to be an important discovery. He called for an expedition to find the rest of it. Our story starts in Paris, at the final resting place of the fragment of what the French press once called the eighth wonder of the world. Now we see the meteorites. The latest expedition to search for it will include Dr. Sarah Russell of London's Natural History Museum. Her French counterpart, Claude Perron, is the keeper of the four kilo fragment. That is the meteorite. It's beautiful, isn't it? It looks very fresh. Yeah, it looks very fresh. Yeah. A bit rusted outside. Yeah, it's obviously been in the desert for a yeah. while mm -hmm. on the surface. Has the meteorite been age dated? Gina? Well, it's, um, it dates um, back to about 4.4 uh, billion years ago. Yeah. Right at the beginning of the solar system, so, yeah. when the planets Actually, were first yeah. forming. Yeah, and it formed, well, that's what's, uh, what we believe at the moment, that it formed by impact between the two asteroids. Right, it collided with each other. Mm. So do you believe there is a big meteorite out there? No, I don't think so. Not a chance? No. <laughs> Seventy years ago, people thought differently. Expeditions were dispatched, but returned empty-handed and confused. Repair's honesty and even his sanity were called into question, but one scientist championed his cause. Theodore Mono's study of fossil fish took him to the Sahara, where he also searched for the meteorite on and off for 60 years. Still teaching at 97, he remembers repair well. He said that, uh, that he had found a small interesting rock 
we show them at the right. But that near the small rock which it had found on the ground, there was another one of the same kind, made also of a meteoritic uh, iron, but of a quite a different size. You sound as if you don't really believe that story, but you still went back there to look yourself. Oh, I went to Shengiti, not only for that, but uh, for other things also. Even one of the local uh, chiefs told me, even if uh, if they would try till the end, of the, till the the last judgment, <laughs> they would not find anything. Professor Mono now believes Repair mistook a rocky outcrop for a meteorite. Undeterred, Sarah Russell believes her expedition will uncover the truth. Maps of the Sahara are out of date almost as soon as they are printed. The Great Sand Sea marches with the wind, but an experienced guide can navigate through the dunes as they shift. The second member of the expedition is an expert in deserts and how to survive them. Bob Watt had been to Nouakchott, the Mauritanian capital, before. He arrived ahead of the others to begin the search for the vehicles that could mean the difference between life and death out in the desert. I'm a serving officer in the Metropolitan Police in London, and my professional curiosity was aroused with this, uh, with this expedition. It was a bit of a detective story. I'm a very experienced Saharan expedition leader and have been here on numerous occasions. The location of good vehicles is, is, is quite often somewhat of a problem. What we need is principally really good sand tires, good cross grip, great big knobs on them to churn and hold the sand up as we cross it. A raised air intake because the light sand will get into the air filters and will cause problems for the engine. For an expedition, when you're venturing to an area that doesn't even have a name that the locals have given it, we must, under these conditions, have only the very, very best equipment because our lives ultimately depend on it. Okay. Another way of crossing the Mauritanian Sahara is by train. Passengers ride in a steel carriage that's two and a half kilometers away from the locomotive. It's the longest and hottest train in the world. Sarah Russell takes the train south to rendezvous with Bob. With her is her colleague, Dr. Phil Bland. He'll be bringing high technology to the search in the shape of a portable magnetometer. If the meteorite is buried, if we can't see it above the sand, then this thing might be able to help us spot it, like beneath the sand. Um, essentially what it does is detect micro changes in the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so you'll, what I'll do, I'll take a reading every 10 meters, record that, and if there's a big variation over that sort of range, then we'll read it. Repair's story doesn't doesn't have the feel of a hoax to it. And the only real other option, apart from him telling the truth, is that it was a hoax. He, he got so little out of it that I can't really believe that, that it was a hoax. I'm not so sure about this repair story because um, so many expeditions have been out there to look for it and no one's ever found it. There's another mystery. It's unheard of for such a large meteorite to land in one piece. It's a type of meteorite that's, that's really tough. So you'd think that, that maybe, you know, if anything could land of that yeah. size, then that'd be, yeah. that'd well, be one that could do it. Yeah, that's true. I, I think something like a, a, a meteorite that's made of stone and iron, like the Chinguetta meteorite, is the best kind of meteorite that we have that might just survive like an impact like that. But I still don't think there's any evidence that it would have done. Two hundred kilometers to the south, Bob Watt, like Gaston Repair before him, has set up home in Chinguetti. The first thing is to ensure that you take with you the equipment and other other necessities that you are going to need. 
no matter how much you research your subject, there's always going to throw something at you that you haven't prepared for. Of equal importance was to locate a guide who is local. Kaza is somebody that uh, I, I have known from before and is a man who fitted the bill absolutely exactly. Sarah and Phil arrived from the railway station, 12 hours away across the desert. The team is now complete. It was the first time I'd met Bob, and, uh, and it's, but I knew a bit about him. You know, I knew he was uh, like a police officer and they'd been on loads of trips. I knew he'd been out a few times with, uh, on expeditions with meteorite hunters. I introduced this to Kazar, our guide, who's uh, such a bubbly bloke. Yeah, he's, he's, he's gorgeous. <laughs> Jingiti is the seventh holy city of Islam, and traditionally, Islamic scholars from this part of Africa would stop at Jingiti and deposit their manuscripts, their books, before making their pilgrimage to Mecca. They would then return with manuscripts from the other side of the world, thus Jingiti became a center of learning. The mosque dates back almost a thousand years. The city itself, there are very few inhabitants left in the old part of town because the sand dunes have advanced so much and, and, and have buried it. It is one of the most beautiful places I've seen. First stop is the market. It was here that Repair overheard a conversation between camel drivers and first learned of the mysterious source of iron that lay out in the dunes. All the women are actually doing all the selling. The women are doing all the work and the men are sitting around gossiping, which is probably why Repair um, heard all the, uh, heard the gossip from the men other than the women. Yeah, I think he had. Yeah. 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 There don't seem to be many camel drivers. Yeah, okay. yeah it's scalped down here. Yeah. Would have been a, an amazing place to, yeah. to have lived, you know. In Reaper's original account, the thing that first got him interested in in going out in the desert and looking for a big sort, a big lump of iron was that a lot of the locals were using iron tools and iron pots and pans, and it sounds like that was quite unusual back then. The locals call, call it the iron of God, or at least that's, you know, that's the sort of story that's been handed down to us from repair. It seems to me if there is this big hunk of iron out there and the people were using it until, you know, at least like the early part of this century, there might be some bits still hanging around. What I'm looking for is um, any bits of local iron. Some of these walls are a thousand years old and uh, they'll incorporate any, any bits of junk, any sort of weathered <clears throat> items in them. So if we, can find, if we can find bits of iron, that might be evidence for the meteorite. Something, something like that, for instance. So that's rusted, but it, it looks old. Maybe that's from a, a drainage pipe or, or a vase or something like that. Now, I can't tell by looking at it that it's from the meteorite, but um, if there's any nickel in it, Sarah's test will be able to tell us that. Sarah has unpacked her chemistry set. Her tests will show whether the ancient inhabitants of Chinggeti used iron from outer space. What else have you got for me? Well, this is, um, this is the nail we found near the mosque in the old bit of town. It looks like quite a nice yeah, sort of old knack of nail. So I'm hopeful that that might have a bit of, you know, meteorite stuff in it. It's a bit of a house. If this goes red, then it's a meteorite. Mm. Yeah. It's not really saying red to me. Just give it a second. That's no, not saying red to me. <laughs> Sarah's tests have uncovered no new evidence. Meanwhile, Bob, ever the detective, has been conducting his own inquiries in the village. Interesting development. I was uh, been here a couple of days now, and word's got around to us what we're looking for. He's in the market, and uh, found an old well digger. 
He was out a few years ago and he found a very big, black, interesting rock. He won't, won't appear in film, but he sent his brother, who was with him, to come and help us. Phil and Sarah are very interested. It's, I don't think it's free for its rock because it's in the wrong, uh, wrong location. But uh, unfortunately for me, it's right out in the middle of the big dunes and we can't take the vehicles there. And uh, that means a rather old fashioned and my least favorite form of desert transport. The team decides to risk the two days it will take to investigate what sounds like a second large meteorite. Bob delays the departure until the cool of the late afternoon. As they reach the edge of town, the temperatures drop to 112 degrees. Though they've traveled to the Sahara in search of a million ton meteorite, the expedition diverts to follow up reports of another one, a day's walk from Chinguetti. At midday, it would be 126 degrees in the shade, if there was any. Time to read, doze, and dig your own bathroom, and then get out of the sun. And we've just stopped for a bit of a rest because it's getting so hot outside. Um, we've uh, set up this uh, tent to give ourselves a bit of shade. It's been incredible for both of us, I think, to yeah. be part of an expedition like this. Just uh, to see all these huge numbers of camels and to be wandering over the dunes. Just out in the middle of the desert. It doesn't feel real, actually. Uh, Bob really hates camels. I think he had a bad experience with a camel once. I think he? so, yeah, I think so. He's not really told us what it is. No, they're there. Yeah, there could, be, could be a little mystery there. <laughs> My only desert experience up till now has been collecting meteorites. I mean, we kind of select somewhere that will be easy to get to so that we can drive yeah. into and then just walk around. I've never had to do anything like this yeah. camel stuff before. Makes it a lot more impressive. <laughs> I absolutely refuse to get in the back of one of these things and um, ride it. They're grumpy, bad-tempered things. We're going to head over here, which is where the guide said that, that the meteorite is. His description is um, about six metres by four, which if the third dimension is, is about four metres, then that makes it over a thousand tons. Yeah. So that could yeah. be the that could be one of the meteorite. biggest meteorites ever found. Yeah. How long ago did they uh, un unbury it? I think it was you reckon three to four years okay. ago, and um, so call it between three and five years, just to lay a margin of error. And has anyone been back there since then? No, no, they haven't, because the, the well, first well is okay, but this well wasn't successful. The well digger's brother has gone ahead to find the rock. With 500 metres to go, excitement is mounting. So I hope he doesn't mean that it's this I hope so rock. This black rock. Yes, Without waiting for the translation, the British begin to fear the worst. So he's he's on empty What? This is the mission. Well, he's on me the hammer. What they're telling us yeah. is... <laughs> Why not? I don't think... What they're telling us... What he's telling us that this is... No, it's just... It's obviously sandstone. It's, it's more of this, yeah, sedimentary stuff. It's just the same as all the other rocks. Sandstone. 
Now where is the what? metal, mate? The metal, who are the fur? This diversion has cost the expedition two precious days. It's not just the camels that are at the end of their tethers. It's absolutely impossible for anyone to be yeah. mistaken yes. <laughs> about, about so a I lump of iron versus this stuff. I think our guide has been uh, winding his up, actually. Or perhaps a little bit too anxious to please. Mm. Well, it's a charitable way of looking at it. I'd go yeah. for the wind-up, yeah. <laughs> Back in Chinggeti, the air is thick with the moisture that signals the onset of the autumn rains. The team seeks spiritual guidance from the Imam. The walls of his mosque have heard a thousand years of whispered secrets. They find him with his pupils at the Quranic school. It transpired he had heard old men speak of a great stone that fell from the sky, crushing some blasphemers. It happened a long time ago, somewhere to the east of town. Bob and Kaza asked if we had the blessing of Islam for the search. We did. The Imam said he knew nothing about whether there was a stone out there and didn't know anything about the natural source of iron, but he'd have to be the first to know if we found it. Back on the trail of Repair's meteorite, the expedition strikes west and then south of Chinggeti, skirting a great range of impassable dunes. Where the ground is firm, they make good progress, but the sand on either side of the piste is treacherous, and a lapse of concentration could spell disaster. Fifteen kilometers out, the expedition runs into trouble. Sarah and Phil take the opportunity to leave their vehicle and go exploring. Over millions of years, the local rocks have acquired a dark coating of oxides known as desert varnish. Sandstone that's weathered in this way can confuse inexperienced meteorite hunters. Theodore Mono has suggested that repair could have been one of them. At first glance, this sort of rock surface with the desert varnish on it looks a bit like a meteorite surface because as meteorites come through the atmosphere, the outside of them melts away a bit and makes a black, glossy exterior. But if you uh, have a look on the inside, there we go. You can see it's actually just a sandstone. Okay. How's that? Yeah, it's very difficult. You can see how easy it is to get stuck in this uh, in this region. These guys are very experienced drivers. The fella gets stuck, spend a lot of time driving in Arabia. As the sand changes colour, the density of the sand changes and it grips onto your tyres. Um, you've got to be very, very careful because it can change within inches. And uh, if you get stuck out in this heat, you're in big trouble. Phil is out in the heat, doing what comes naturally to meteorite hunters. When we're actually out searching for the meteorites, basically all you do is, is walk up and down and you just kind of throw your gaze out and scan the ground and see if you can see a little dark rock. It's actually quite, um, it's kind of like fishing, I guess. I find it quite sort of a Buddhist activity because it's very, uh, there's something quite mellow about it. Well, it's pretty hot up there. They've been up about half an hour now. It's about 108 degrees. Some bad weather coming in from over there. I've only got about a litre of water apiece and they've gone through that already. Give me another five, ten minutes, I'm going to have to call them in. Very, very hot today. Travelling east, the expedition encounters a feature that no meteorite hunter could ignore, the famous Elul Crater. It's proof that Mauritania has been hit by at least one great heavenly body before. There is no scientific link between this impact structure and Repair's fabled meteorite, but there is a historical connection. This impact crater that was discovered by Porquier in 1938, he was uh, flying around the area actually looking for Repair's rock. Um, 
it's at that time there was an awful lot of interest people were getting very excited about the possibility of finding such a big meteorite out in the desert so there'd, there'd already been a few expeditions on the ground and no one had found this huge, this pretty huge impact crater in that area um, so that tells you something about how a desert can hide a large feature, a large object. On the opposite lip of the crater, Bob keeps watch. This is a dangerous season. One of the main dangers in deserts is the danger of flash floods coming down through different gullies. There are more people drowned in deserts of the world by camping in the wrong places than there are die of thirst. It's uh, temperatures drop considerably. We've got a lot of storm coming in. I'm just wait and see when this next one comes in. The magnetometer detects minute differences in the Earth's magnetic field caused by the presence of large bodies of iron that have their own magnetism. Here, the search is for fragments of the Alu meteorite that might have punched through the floor of the crater after arriving 12 times faster than a rifle bullet. We're getting some pretty wacky readings. Uh, I think at first we were, we were getting quite excited. We thought there might be, uh, it seemed like there was a big blip here. So it was, um, readings were a lot higher than, than elsewhere and it, we were, getting a little bit optimistic there might be something buried you know maybe a fragment of meteorite if the meteorite uh, was coming in at an angle we would expect perhaps it to come in and implant itself on the other side could of the like crater punch through the bottom of the crater but um but now looking around at the weather we're not really sure whether our blips are real because there's really something underneath there or or if it's just uh, because of the electrical storm might going be a thunderstorm, on that's, that's which might the stuff up the, the magnetics the magnetometer, so we're not really sure. By rights, Repair's meteorite should have exploded, making a crater even larger than Alul. There is one theory that explains how it might have arrived without trace. What's interesting is that whether Repair's rock is out there or not, there is actually a way that things that big can survive to hit the Earth's surface. The Alul one comes in pretty steep. So it might be only 20 meters, but it comes at a steep angle, punches through the atmosphere and hits really hard, dumps all its energy at a point and blows up like that. But, um, but every now and then, maybe one time in a hundred, it'll actually come in really, really shallow. So it'll hit the top of the atmosphere at maybe two or three degrees and the horizon is dropping away from it as it's coming in. So it actually lands at a shallower angle than it hits the atmosphere on. And that might happen once every million years. At dusk, the convoy makes for a location that's central to the story. According to Professor Mono, it is Repair's meteorite. A rocky outcrop called Aunet Umcher. Theodore Mono has convinced himself that this is where Repair was brought and we wanted to experience it in the same light to see if such a mistake was possible. Well, it's just after sunrise. This is about the time that Reaper would have uh, arrived. Ridden through the night from Tringiti, 33K over this way. And uh, this is the sort of light he would have seen it in. He's described as burnished like a mirror shining in the, uh, in the sun. Um, quite a well-known local landmark. And this is the sort of conditions that Reaper would have looked at it, but I'm not convinced. And none of the features that he was describing are here. Well, it's the right sort of colour to mm. uh, the same sort of colour as the meteorite was. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not really burnished in the sun, though, is it? It's no, not it's a not mirror. It's shiny. No. And it's kind of breaking up like, um, like sandstone does in just big blocks. I think even by starlight you could tell that it's, that it's sandstone. Yeah. No shiny bits there. To be honest, I can't really understand uh, the whole like mono pitch because he throws out everything from Repair's account apart mm. from the height and the width of the thing, mm. which seems to me, the, if I was Repair, that's the easiest thing to exaggerate. Yeah. I just don't see the point of including the, the dimensions of it and throwing out the rest. No, 
It was a high point and a low point. If Repair hadn't mistaken sandstone for iron, it looked as though he'd made up the whole story. The team now have questions about Théodore Monod's theories and Gaston Repair's character. Let's have a look at it. What do we know about, what do we know about Reaper himself? I mean, the guy was yeah. born in Iran. He's a highly distinguished military officer, served with distinction in the First World War, got wounded and sent back out here because he's unfit for duty in the front line. Not a man prone to easy mistakes. Yeah. With a bit of geological knowledge, I just can't see it being a mistaken identity sort of issue. Well, I, I know he collected rocks, but how much do we actually know about Repair and, and, and his geological knowledge? I mean, I know, I know he had a degree in science, but did that include any formal training in geology? That's true, we don't really know, mm. but, um, but it just, I, can't see, I, I just can't see anyone mistaking that outcrop for, for a metallic mass. It just seems yeah. such a stretch. Yes. Could Repair, this mm. distinguished military man, I've been lying, a hoax. It just doesn't feel like a hoax. He got so little out of it, he didn't make any fuss about it. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, 15 mm -hmm. years later before people bothered interviewing him again. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's just and not... I think the bottom line is that there is a meteorite that he managed to produce. I exactly. mean, how did he get hold of that mm -hmm. if it was a hoax? Very good point, yeah. Mauritania is a land rich in iron and diamonds and the people who come to look for them. But in Nuakchot, the team call on a retired prospector who spent his life searching the desert for water from the air. Like most Frenchmen of his age, he knows the repair story well. Jacques Galoudec isn't just convinced that repair was telling the truth. He believes he's actually seen the meteorite and has map references for it. He has a sketch of the distinctive rock showing a dried up watercourse in front of it. Galoudek told us he'd spent much of his long life working for the Mauritanian Water Service, flying over the desert prospecting for new wells. Back in the 1980s, it seems he flew over a rock of the right size and colour, exactly where Repair said he saw his. He's the only living person we know of who claims to have seen the meteorite. Jacques Galoudek's directions were precise. But Théodore Mono had followed them and found nothing. A great deal rested on being there at the right time of day, with the sun in the correct position. This is the most promising lead yet, and the team is revitalized. The rock Galoudek had spotted lay amid huge dunes at the edge of the Great Sand Sea, in a depression hemmed in by high plateaus and deep gorges. It would take five days to reach by a circuitous route. With safety as the first concern, Bob is now in charge of the expedition. He's committed to getting the team as near as possible. But in the damp air, the thin crust of firm sand can't support the heavy vehicles. In one day, they've covered five kilometers. The most important thing to watch out driving over here is all these rocks, because it can rip your tires to shreds. One of the reasons why it was so important for us to have very, very good tires and uh, before we left on this trip. And the other thing is the sudden depressions as we're traveling, like I just tore in a big circle there, because uh, you can't see with a light like this how deep they go and they can throw people off their seats. So you've obviously got to be very, very careful about, um, about your vehicle, because if it breaks, you're in some extreme amounts of trouble. I'm not quite sure what we actually do if we find this thing. I know. I, mean, yeah. I want to take about a million pictures. Yeah, same. And I feel like I should have something like important to say, you know. But I don't. <laughs> yeah, you can... I don't know if I'm going to be able to manage it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think. I don't think I'll be able to do anything except uh, throw up in excitement. Or <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> same, yeah. Well, it's not really a lucky charm because obviously I'm far too. Logical scientific. and scientific to believe in such things, but I'm going to wear this while I look for the meteorite. Oh, uh, that's very there's sweet. There's a little picture of Nessie, you see, just there. So. Very sweet. My boyfriend just gave me a supply of vitamin pills. Really? It's not very <laughs> romantic, is it? The area they're heading for is literally off the map. It's so little visited, it has no name. 
For every advance, there's a retreat as the guides navigate with little more than instinct to lead them. Once again, the scientists take advantage of the holdup. After making good time, the convoy grinds to a halt on top of an exposed plateau with no obvious route down. Okay, at the moment we're on uh, a rock field, which is basically the last outcrop that we're going to get before, before we get into the dunes, which are over there. We're only probably about um, five or ten k's away from the spot that Jack Gallaudet indicated on his map. Um, so it's, this is probably the most difficult area we've gone through, and it's really rocky, there's big boulders everywhere, the cars are having a lot of trouble. But our guides are out looking around trying to find a way through and they're absolutely amazing, we'd be lost without them. So I th I'm hopeful we'll be able to get through before too long. I just want to get in there and start looking really. By retracing their tracks, the convoy escapes the rock field and heads for a ridge that overlooks the target area. The guides hope they can get down the other side. Then the weather changes. It sort of whipped up about the time that we said, oh, let's set out there and see if we yeah, can walk it. That's right. <laughs> so I'm frankly suspicious. <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think anyone's trying to stop us, but it's certainly it's very frustrating. the elements are making it as hard as possible. Uh, we we can't, can't get out there on this well, it's too dangerous. We're still six kilometers from our destination. We can't get the vehicles down off of here. I'm so frustrated because we can see where we want to get to from the edge of the plateau. But with this weather, we're, we're stuck. When it clears, the scientists want to abandon the vehicles and walk. It's a tense time for Bob. Okay. It's too risky. Okay. Here is the place among the places the most dangerous in Mauritania. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Kaza is basically saying that this is the hardest, most difficult place in Mauritania. <coughs> Marching out tonight wouldn't be a problem, but there's, there isn't a moon or anything like that. No, that's right. And they're, they're saying it's, it's pretty difficult to get that done tonight. I don't think we should do it in the dark, but if we left now, we could do We've it and be back as night's falling. Yeah. You haven't. It's 20 to 4. And, and it's dark at 7. I just don't want to come three and a half thousand k's to like sit like a couch potato. <laughs> I know. Of rain. Not get I know. You know? I'm of the opinion that tonight, it's, it's too risky to do it tonight. There's no moon. Um, we're going to get there and come straight back. I, I understand what you're saying and I want to get out there as well, but I don't think we're going to achieve too much tonight. Okay. These guys are low, know the area. I know, Bob. Yeah, I've yeah. just been on quite a few expeditions, that's all. Yeah, so I, know, I, know, like I know. Fresh I know. face. I know, yeah, but, I don't I think there's any danger, except that whether we will have very much time now. That's that's the only issue for this evening. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's not worth going within the amount of time that we've got, but I, I don't think that we'll be endangering ourselves no, no, by no. having a try. Okay. Right, let's go for it. Short walk out, but we're not going, we're not, we turn back at uh, 5.15. At 5.15? At 5.15. 5.15? Yeah, we turn back at 5.15. Okay, let's do that. Let's go okay. now. Oh! oh. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> there are times when to be dictatorial is what you have to do. For instance, if we had been caught out in the sand dunes in that sandstorm, the leadership style at that stage must be dictatorial. The position of an expedition leader can be very unpopular sometimes because you have to make decisions and you have to force your will upon the team quite often, which does irritate people. Everybody who comes in an expedition like this got a strong personality, got a willful streak about them, otherwise they wouldn't be here. The team returns to camp at 7 o'clock. The temperature is 101 degrees. What have you found? Well, Sarah and Phil got some interesting rocks and stuff. Um, we made 5k across the sand. Some very interesting stuff in the dunes, a couple of k's distance. If you ask Sarah and Phil about what we found, the bits of rocks, it's uh, quite interesting. 
It's uh, hot work. Yeah. Really hot work. So, what have we found? What did you find? That was good, yeah. So, uh, so we kind of walked out towards, there's a stripey dune out there, which is probably in the middle of where we reckon, you know, yeah. Galudek's spot might be. And uh, we picked up loads of, loads of bits of magnetite and some quite chunky bits as well. Well, <laughs> now you see magnetite is uh, really, really common, isn't it, as a geological, right? But they're chunky bits and they're all, these are all sandstone, so they shouldn't really have it in. Uh, and it can be like weathering off the surface of an iron meteorite, you know, so. Although there are hundreds of other explanations. <laughs> there are one yeah. or two other explanations. <laughs> The camp on the ridge is too far from the search area, so the convoy tries to reach it from the other side, via a vast, silent plain. When they finally arrive, they are literally at the edge of the map in a place with no name. Phil and Sarah have one day to find the biggest meteorite on Earth. Okay, I programmed the position of the camp into the GPS. Okay. So when you get yourselves out, you can use that to find your way back. If not, when you get out as far as you're going, follow your footsteps back, back to camp, so that way you're not gonna get lost. And go and have good luck. All righty. Right. See you folks, good luck. Cheers, mate. Bye, Bob. Yeah, from what he's given me in a description, there's a dune shaped round like this and Gallaudet was very precise in describing the rock as being in behind here. He typically, he, he described Mono, who has been out to have a look at this area, as coming in at the wrong time because you need to be in at a certain time early in the morning, which Sierra and Phil went off in there fairly early, to be able to see the contour and the shape of the rock to realise what it was. It's pretty <laughs> sticky stuff. Yeah. So should we try somewhere along here? Yeah, why not? So that's pretty much north. It feels amazing to be here actually, after after quite a few trials and tribulations to actually get yeah. here and have a chance. Yeah, it feels like quite an achievement just to make it here. Yeah. Well all we're really that's trying to do now is uh, is just pop on the tops of big dunes and see if there's anything weird about like the magnetic field near there. Because um, you can kind of see in places down to the bedrock, so you get a feel for how high the dunes are. Yeah, we know it has to be higher than 40 metres, otherwise we may as well not even bother. Not bother, yeah. If Repair's meteorite is here, and even half the size that he'd estimated, it's still bigger than any other known to science. But by now, it could be well buried. I've got no problems with the two of them being in there. They're both very experienced and they've got my GPS, they can get back. Absolutely no worries with that, but we do have to consider safety. We're a long way from any help if something does happen. This is their life's work. This is their two of the leading meteoriticists in, in, in the country. Yeah, three, four, eight. She's been irritatingly consistent. Yeah, consistently saying there's no meteorite right here. That's right. Right, now we're... <laughs> Onwards. Same sort of numbers, mate, yeah. This is a place um, that kind of fits the description of what Jack Gallaudet said, what he told us, uh, the, you know, the thing that he saw, the rock that he saw. There's not a big rock here, but he said there was a water course, and this is a hollow that looks like it might have held one. Um, and it's a big dune, so we, it might be worth looking under, but it's the same numbers as we've been getting. So, go down and have a word with Sezi. On the ground, Gallaudet's sketch is no help. All the dunes look the same. There could be a meteorite the size of an office block under any of them. Have you found anything? With an hour of daylight left, and only enough water for an uninterrupted journey back to Cinghetti, time is running out for the scientists. Oh, 
Bücher. There's a lot of desert out there. Yeah. There's a lot of very big dunes. Repair seems to me to have been quite an honest bloke, but um, so many people have been out there and looking for it, and nobody's found it, so it makes me think that he must have been mistaken. I kind of think that he made it up, actually. I think I'll go to that option. I would go with Sarah's option. Um, I don't think there is a meteorite out there. I think it's uh, perhaps another desert legend. And Reaper has been taken out to see a huge mountain of Ireland. He saw what he thought he wanted to see, and by a coincidence, he's picked a meteorite up. I don't think it's there. Gaston Repair was a trusted civil servant and highly decorated officer. When he returned to the desert to his desk here at the local army base, he could hardly have imagined that over the next 80 years, 10 major expeditions would fail to find his meteorite. That in some quarters he would be called a fool or a hoaxer. This place is brilliant. He died in 1957, unconcerned by what people thought, committed to his story. Tremendous place. If there is a giant meteorite out there, the desert is keeping it secret. The winds blow, the sands move on, but so does science. Three months later, Sarah is back at her desk in the museum. Bob is back on the beat. Phil is in Antarctica. His magnetite has been tested and found wanting. Well, we've been doing some tests since we got back from Mauritania. Uh, we had a look at the magnetite that Phil picked up, but the results are inconclusive. We can't really tell whether the magnetite came from a meteorite or not. Sarah has also obtained her own slice of the Chinggeti fragment and sent a shaving of it to a fellow researcher in America. His email contains definitive answers about its origin, answers that add to the mystery. He found, first of all, that the age of the Chinggeti meteorite um, is less than 30,000 years. That's the age that, that it's been lying around on Earth. His second result is a bit disappointing. He found that the pre-atmospheric size of the Chinggeti meteorite can't have been bigger than one metre. So this meteorite can't have been bigger than one metre when it came to Earth. I think this leaves us with several possibilities. First of all, Repair could have just been lying about the whole story, but somehow that doesn't really fit with what we know about him. He seems like a, a pretty trustworthy kind of person. The second possibility is that it was a huge coincidence that Repair saw this very, very strange looking object in the desert, and coincidentally, on top of it, there was this meteorite. What do you think is the most likely explanation? Well, I think that it was several years uh, between the day when Repair picked up a rock and the day when the meteorite was catalogued in Paris. And there must have been plenty of opportunities for it to have got, been meddled up with some other sample. Um, maybe the thing that we've got here it just isn't the thing that Repair saw. If Repair was telling the truth, he witnessed a star that fell and was caught. To believe him is to ignore science. It is to believe in miracles. So might it still be out there? It might still be out there in the desert, yeah. <laughs>